Matthew chapter 9 this morning, we, we begin a new chapter, a new day, a new work, and a new word from the Lord to us, specifically this morning to you as you're gathered here at this church, so that we can grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and in our relationship with him, but also in our fellowship one with another in the body of Christ here. And so we are looking at Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. Let me ask you a question right up front. Are you free from the stronghold of guilt? Are you free from the guilt that you have or had or are having? There's a guilt that comes with sin. There's a guilt that comes with pain and suffering. There's a guilt that comes with a hurt person and a hurt heart that comes from way back in the past. Does that guilt still hold you? Are you still thinking about things that are no longer there? Are you moving forward from that guilt? And so this morning we're going to talk about how Jesus has come to free us from the guilt of sin and the guilt of pain and suffering. Let me give you a quick review because I, I have really been emphasizing this as we've been going through this gospel and what the gospel really is written about. You should all know this by now, right? Why is Matthew writing this gospel? To present Jesus as what? We don't know yet? Okay, let's start over. Chapter 1, we have the genealogy of Jesus Christ, right? It's showing his pedigree, that he is the king from the line of David. Chapter 2, we see Jesus' incarnation. He's born as a king. Chapter 3, the announcement by the angels themselves that he is the king and the Messiah. Chapter 4, he has uh, been approved by the temptation of Satan up there on the mountain, that he has the authority and the power as the king. He's been certified as the king of the Jews. And then chapters 5 through 7, which we spent a lot of time in, it was the king's uh, uh, constitution from the Sermon on the Mount there as he given it to his disciples. And then 8 through 9, we see the king's power, that the king has power and authority, because every king needs to have power and authority, right? Otherwise, they're really no king. They're powerless. They really have no uh, authority whatsoever over their kingdom. And so Jesus is presented with power and authority here. And in reality, you can probably divide Matthew into two sections. The first section is 1 through 10, chapters 1 through 10, as the king being revealed. And so he reveals Jesus as the king. And then chapters 11 through 28, the king is rejected. From that point on, it just goes downhill for Jesus as planned. He is rejected as the king of the Jews. In verses 1 through 8, we show Christ forgiving a paralytic man of his sins, but also healing the man. And so this morning's theme is son of man, son of man. And it's speaking of Jesus Christ and his might. Uh, messiatic uh, position let's go ahead and read the text and i'll point out a couple of things verse one <clears throat> so he got into a boat crossed over and came to his own city then behold they brought to him a paralytic lying in the bed and when jesus saw their faith he said to the paralytic son be of good cheer your sins are forgiven you and at once some of the scribes and within themselves said within themselves this man blasphemies, but Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he arose, departed to his house. Now when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God who had given such power to men, who has given such power to men. Two things that I want you to see here is the men involved. We see a man who is paralyzed by some diseased or possibly a result of sin. And he's lying in a bed and friends who love him very dearly hear that Jesus is in town or back in town and they bring this man to Jesus to be healed. And so they have great faith. And then the healing is done along with the forgiveness of sins of this man. The scribes, the religious leaders, become very angry at Jesus because they have the authority to recognize whether God has forgiven a man of sins or not. 
And so they're in cinch, and so they begin to speak among themselves, uh, speak within their minds as to who is this guy, who does he think he is coming among us. And the crowd is amazed that Jesus performed this sign, that they're in awe of who he is. So we're going to look at this paralytic man and also uh, the scribe. I have highlighted the paralytic line on his bed and I also highlighted the scribe said within themselves because you have two groups of people. The, the one group have total faith in God. And they're trusting in him. They're hoping in him that he will deliver them from this illness that this man has. And Mark tells us that they literally broke through a roof and laid him down by Jesus as the crowd was around him. And then you have another group, a religious group, who was raised in the church, who had been through the customs, has been through the system, and it's a system that's been established forever. And Jesus comes, and he seems to be a rebel, a radical, seems to be a new way. And they're confused. They're in an uproar because he's changing things. It's not supposed to be this way. Uh, you're just a man, and yet you're forgiving sins. That's blasphemy. And so we need to deal with you because you're now in our arena in this religious system and we won't have this in our religious system and the people are embracing him because they see the sincerity the power of his words the authority over over demonic beings over illnesses and also the ability to forgive sins and so they're in awe of him and they're marveling as to who this man can be what a beautiful savior we serve Obviously, Jesus is involved here, and Jesus should be involved in, in everything that we do in our lives. And you will find, if you haven't already, miracles in your lives on a daily basis as God works and walks with you. So this is a beautiful story. I, I love this story. It, it, it is a, a win story, kind of a story that brings hope, a story that we can read and say, wow, Lord, you're awesome and that you forgive us of our sins, and that you also heal us from time to time. And if not on this earth, then definitely in heaven, that we will be healed completely. Now, this story is also told in Mark and in Luke, and in greater detail, as it seems Ma Matthew kind of points to certain things about Jesus' authority and his power, to, again, to present him as king. So he leaves things out. His story is a little shorter, again, than the others. Matthew leaves out the fact that friends brought him and then the fact that the friends lowered him down into uh, the room where Jesus was at. So he, he's not concerned about those particulars there. He's more concerned about Jesus and the interaction with the man and also with the religious leaders there. In fact, Matthew uses 126 words, whereas Mark uses 196 and Luke uses 212. I don't know if that matters to you or not, but... Uh, Matthew is just straight and to the point, you know, uh, like uh, some men are. You ever notice that about people? Some are just straight and a matter of fact to the point, and, and you've got to really listen and, and hear what they're saying because they're not going to repeat it and they're not going to expound on it. They're just so you like miss a lot. And, and those men, usually you do miss a lot because you're really not uh, hearing the intention. You're not hearing the, the whole understanding of it. So they just say, go over there. You're like, okay, okay, but what am I supposed to do, and how am I going to get there? And, and then others are, are they're long-winded, right? You know, well, I want you to go out these doors, and then as you're going out these doors, I want you to make a left, and as you make a left, you're going to see a rock on the side, some beautiful plants, and so forth. Oh, and I always love those beautiful plants. The roses, when they bloom in the summertime, are wonderful. You know, blah, blah, blah. That's Virginia, right? You guys are all laughing because you know what I'm talking about. And then, you know, they get you to that place, and you're going like, okay, come on, get to the point. And, and so uh, Matthew, straight to the point, Jesus continues to, again, display his authority, demonstrating his power in this instant here to forgive sins, to forgive sins. So that's when the emphasis, the scribes began to express discontent, accusing Jesus of blasphemy. And eventually in chapter 12, we'll see that it comes to a climax as they're incinged. So let's go ahead and, and look at the text now a little closer says in verse 1. Now, verse 1 is interesting because I think it really says a lot more than what we think 
<clears throat> as we read it. It says, so he got into the boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. Now that's interesting because of a couple of things. We know he just left his own city, Capernaum. You remember he was there in Capernaum, and they <clears throat> literally got into the boat and were in the storm, and they were going to the Gadrian, to that area, specifically to those two demon-possessed men and to those town cities. And then immediately from there, he comes back to Capernaum. So that tells us that he literally went there on purpose for them. He didn't have to go that way. It was a short missionary trip, right, in a sense. But he knew that down the road, uh, that testimony, that healing uh, would be bigger than ever before. And so he purposely went down there. And that says a lot about Jesus, that he is concerned about individuals, even if those individuals are on islands all by themselves. You ever feel like you're an island on, by yourself and nobody else is around you? Nobody else cares? Nobody else understands? And it might be because you are understandable. <laughs> you know, you're a hard person to get along with. You know, that could be true. But you know what? God understands and God loves you, even if you're an island by yourself. I know that in our relationships, we can feel like we're an island by ourselves. You could be married, and yet you feel like you're an island by yourself, because I've been through that. I felt like I was an island by myself for, for many, many, many times. Uh, she doesn't understand me. He doesn't understand me. You know, you're not hearing what I'm saying. Yes, I'm hearing what you're saying. Well, understand that Jesus knows, Jesus understands, and he purposely comes to your island to sit with you and to heal you, to humble you. And either you receive him or you reject him. Uh, the men received him. The demons were cast into the pigs. They went over the cliff. The townspeople got upset and says, get out of here. We don't want you. We have a choice to receive him or to reject him. There's a lot in that little verse there. He literally left Capernaum, purposely went through a storm that the enemy brought, to touch these people, and then get back in the boat and comes all the way back to Capernaum, which the crowds are waiting for him. And, and this man is waiting for him and says in verse 2, Behold, or the word can be uh, meaning immediately. It, it's like he gets off the boat and there's the crowd. They brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed there. Uh, the Greek uh, defines bed as, as a pallet or a mattress, maybe even a, a, a little hammock. Uh, don't know what they used back then, one or the other, but literally this man was laying there. We don't know how long, may have been for years, may have been a short time, but he was totally paralyzed, couldn't move, couldn't do anything for himself. And so he's laying there. Mark says that it was in this bed that they lowered him through the roof uh, to see Jesus. Uh, they knew they knew Jesus would deal with him. They knew Jesus had the power and the authority uh, to deal with that. And so they're bringing Jesus, this man, out of love for him, out of compassion, and also out of hope that Jesus would do something. And they would receive uh, more than just a healing. Uh, they would receive a whole new life. And that's really Christianity. It, it's not about the healing, guys. It's not about the material things that we're looking for. It, it is about the peace that we get of our eternal state. That's what Christmas is about. It's not about all this stuff. We're blessed to live in the United States, the rest of the world is living a lot lower in their economy than we are. We are blessed, and that's only by God's grace, nothing else. He could have probably, as Ephesians says, foreknew you before the foundations of the earth and put you right there in Sudan. <laughs> he could have easily done that, and he has with many men and women there or in some other area, but he put you here. And that says a lot about God's love for you and his favor on you when you think about it. No, they received something more than just a healing. <clears throat> this disease that he had was a disease that affected the nervous system, that disabled him, that weakened his limbs. The symptoms of this organic disease uh, would uh, affect uh, the temporary or even the the, the permanent loss of sensation itself. And so you could probably go up to him and touch him and he really didn't feel it too much. Muscle uh, was completely uh, uncontrollable, you know, uh, couldn't uh, move him 
whatsoever, even if he tried. It was probably a, a degenerate condition, uh, which was usually horrible and incurable at that time. Uh, there were a few cases we read in the Bible that are mentioned, and it's uh, usually uh, around Christ's healing ministry where he gets the opportunity to heal them. And this disease may have been brought on. We don't know. It doesn't say that it may have been brought on by injury or even at birth or uh, some sort of accident by uh, falling of some sort and kind of severed his spinal cord. We don't know. Some older commentary suggest uh, there's a possibility there of it being a result of sin, some sort of uh, VD, um, STD uh, sin of some sort because of his lifestyle that had crippled him completely. And if untreated, it definitely would do that. And so it's a result of that sin. Now, the question that comes up, and as you read the text like this, you, you kind of ask, uh, why is it that God allows people to be sick and disabled? He allows them to, because he does allow them to. You have to remember that illness and sickness and the things that we go through in this life, they come from the fall of man. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them perfect. He created them in a perfect environment. And there was no sin at the, in that environment. There was no disease. Uh, there was no sickness whatsoever. And because of their choice, they brought sin into the world. And thus the guilt was upon them. And so Jesus dealt with that guilt by a plan to offer up his son as an ultimate sacrifice to forgive them of that guilt. And so God did that through Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, it was through the sacrifice. In the, in the New Testament, it was through Jesus himself, his very life. And for us today, it's pointing back to Jesus that we can have forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ. But it came from the fall of man. And sometimes it is our fault, whether it's from a sin, or sometimes it is because we get into an accident or <clears throat> some sort of DNA um, malfunction because of the fall of sin, but it's there. And God uses it for his glory. I, I know a man that was literally in a wheelchair for most of his life, got into a car accident, and he was disabled. Uh, but the man loved the Lord. Uh, he went to the Philippines. He served the Lord there on mission trips, uh, got involved in church, and he took what was meant for evil, and he turned it around for for good and so we take these opportunities and we try to turn them around for God's glory that's the important part no matter what you're going through God is allowing you to go through it for a reason he knows that you're able to take it and he knows that you will glorify him through it because in the end you know that you're going to be in heaven with him and all things will be made okay and so if you suffer now for a time, that's good because he suffered for you too. And so we are partakers of his suffering in this fallen world because he also walked among us as a man and thus the son of man. So glorify him in those things. Now, these men, these friends of his uh, were very caring and they were very persistent. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said here in the next statement, and the word saw means to know. He knew these guys had faith. He could tell that they had faith. And the word faith there means truth, or I'm sorry, trust, trust. Jesus knew that they trusted him to do something about this. Now, whose faith was it that he saw? Was it the man's or was it the friends, because you can kind of look at it and say it's the friends that brought the man to Jesus, but I, I kind of put them together. I think it was the friends, but I think it was also the man's faith. They all had the faith and trust in God that Jesus could heal them, and so they were faithful men. They were faithful friends also, and it's faithful friends who will bring you to Jesus. It was their faith of his friends that caught Jesus' attention. And it's good to have friends that have faith in Christ, for they will build your faith, right? That is the whole purpose of the body of Christ, is to have friends in Christ. Yes, we're to reach the world. And I know there's a push. Don't just have friends in Christ. Have worldly friends, too, so that you can reach them. I think that's the key is so that you could reach them. Don't have worldly friends so that you can be involved in their lives because your worldly friends will bring you down. 
It's easier for adults to have Christian friends and not worldly friends. And I'm saying generally speaking, it's harder for youth to have more Christian friends than unchristian friends because they're involved in the public system. And so a lot of their friends are in the schools that they're going to. And these friends are not Christians. A lot of them aren't, not all the time. And I'm just speaking generally. I'm not saying as a matter of fact. And so you have to be very aware of that and you have to be very strong in your faith that you don't allow non-Christian friends to bring you down, but that you're lifted up with Christian friends that will help you and lead you to build your faith in Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. I posted it this morning that on my way here, uh, me and uh, Abigail went, stopped at Starbucks. You know, you see all the decorations and so forth. And it, I just had this memory of a little child uh, going to Mass uh, there in uh, La Puente area and, and how special it seemed to me and exciting to see all the decorations, the lights. You know how little kids get. You know, it just brought all these memories back. And we went to Mass, you know, regularly every Sunday, every Sunday, every Sunday. And then I, I thought, what a, what a blessing that now God has me going uh, to a church and I'm not going there out of a, a, a religious obligation or because my parents told me to go there and I'm, I'm stuck in going there. But now I'm going because I want to hear from God. I want to really hear from God. I want to hear what he's saying through his word and through the minister that's teaching the word of God. I, I want to take those words and I want them to be a part of me. And I want them to change me for, for good or for worse, for correction, for discipline, encouragement, whatever it is. Because that's what we do as Christians now, is we take his word and we apply it to our lives. And then also be with people that love the Lord too, that encourage you and strengthen you and love you, that are there to support you, not to backbite you, not to talk about you, you know, not to, in their mind, like these religious leaders, <clears throat> who is this guy? Yeah. That, that's the world stuff. And I know the church does that, believe me, because we're carnal at times. That shouldn't really be. It's encouraging to gather around a bunch of guys and they're working hard out there. And you wish you could be in there, but they're working hard. They're putting it together, you know. And they're not disgruntled. They're not upset. They're just trying to get it together so that they can continue to serve in God's kingdom. Because that's just a part of the work in God's kingdom, just a part. God's work continues on forever and ever. It's, it's, it's going, whether it's this trailer or whether it's the next project or the next project, there's always going to be a work for the Lord. God has prepared beforehand a work that we should walk in it. And we should have friends that encourage us and strengthen us to go to church, to be involved in church, to be right with God. That's what friends do. Someone said, people who like people are people that people like. <laughs> right? Did you get that? People who like people are people that people like. Be likable, the Bible says. You want friends? Be friendly. The best way to form a friendship is to become interested in other people, not by trying to interest people in you. Be interested in other people. Don't try to make people interested in you because it's not about you. It's about other people. I was, this week, I was walking around in my kitchen area and my wife's mother was there, my mother-in-law, and she was sitting at the table and I can't remember what she was doing. And, and she saw me, hello, Reuben. So I said, hi. And we were in and out all all day, actually the whole week. And, and I got, I just stopped and I said, so you've probably noticed that we're in and out a lot. She goes, yeah. <laughs> and so I explained to her, said, I said, you're going to notice that a lot because we're always serving. We're always serving. We're going here. We're going there. She goes, I noticed that you're always doing something for someone or the church. When she came to the Thanksgiving thing, she was blown away. She was walking around town. People, uh, we're actually feeding people. These are people that no one feeds. And we're feeding them. We're giving them something to eat. Now, this is coming from a lady that, that has been raised in Catholicism that doesn't understand Christianity and hasn't seen it up front. She's lived in an environment that's very sarcastic, that's very negative all the time. And now she sees this environment that's service, 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 service. And, and, and she's surprised by it. And the Lord is working in her heart. That's what we're supposed to display to one another. 
being interested in others, helping one another. Someone wrote, don't walk in front of me. I may not follow. Don't walk behind me. I may not lead. Walk besides me and just be my friend. Just be my friend. People just want friends they can talk to. They can uh, pour into and just listen to me. I don't want an answer. I just want you to listen to me. I had a call several months ago, and it was a high school friend. And so they wanted my advice is what they said. And, and so when they began to speak, I, I, I realized that every time I tried to give them a little advice, they kept speaking. So I realized they didn't want my advice. They just wanted to, to vent. And so for an hour, I just listened to them the whole time. And then, mm-hmm, oh, wow, yes, oh, I agree with you, oh, yeah. The whole time, just, just let them vent. And by the, time, the end of it, I, I felt like, oh, well, do you want me to? Okay, bye, we'll see you later. <laughs> they just wanted an ear to just pour all this out. You know, they needed a vent, and so I was there for them to, to vent. Sometimes just being a friend is a good thing. A friend is a person who goes around saying nice things behind your back. Not bad things, nice things behind your back. That's a true friend. Be a friend. Be like these guys who were really concerned about their friend, that they brought him to Jesus. These men had faith, and faith that works, right? James talks about faith and how faith needs to work. These men had faith like that. They were literally bringing their friend to Jesus. They weren't just saying, oh yeah, Jesus could heal you. Hope you can find someone (laughs) to help you there. No, they literally picked him up and brought him to Jesus. And it says, he said to the paralytic, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. So as they bring him, Jesus talks to the guy and says, son, a, a, a word of endearment, right? Son, you know, I, I understand, son, friend, I love you. Uh, I'm compassionate towards you. I'm going to do something for you. Be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. He didn't say you're healed. He said your sins are forgiven you. That's interesting. He came for a healing and he gets these words, you're forgiven. The word good cheer can be to be bold or to dare or courage. And so Jesus was saying, have courage. Be bold enough here at this moment to understand what I'm about to say. Don't give up hope. Keep hoping, keep trusting, but your sins are forgiven you. And what a letdown that might have been for some people. You know, you're in bed and you're healing, and then all of a sudden God says, yeah, but your sins are forgiven you. For us that understand, we're like, thank you, Lord, that my sins are forgiven, because that means I'm going to heaven. That means I'm not going to hell. That means I'll be with God for eternity. My sins are forgiven. This is the only place that Jesus declares sins being forgiven. So it's important. It would make sense if this guy did something sinful and the result of that was his paralyzing state. And then Jesus come along and say, your sins are forgiven. That would make sense. And he's like, wow. Now maybe he'll deal with my physical Imagine Jesus saying to you, your sins are forgiven. First, understand what sin is. It's missing the mark. You have missed the mark of God, and you have sinned against God. You are still a sinner against God, and you still sin to this very day. In your mind, you sin. The things you view, you sin. The things you say, you sin. Uh, The things that we display in our lives, we sin because we've missed the mark of God. We are oh so wretched men that we are. Who shall deliver us from this body of death? Paul would say in Romans chapter 7 at the very end of the chapter. We are wretched men. We are sinful. We're we're full of corruption. But thank be to God that it's through Jesus Christ who does not condemn us, but he forgives us through the blood of Jesus Christ because he foreknew us. And Jesus forgave us. And there's still forgiveness for us. And what a relief that is. I remember to this day, the day that I realized God had forgiven me of my sins and how I felt like I lost 10 pounds, literally 10 pounds. It was such a neat feeling that it changed my whole life because the weight of sin has been removed. 
Now here's, this is interesting. This is interesting. The words, your sins are forgiven, is an affirmation and not a prayer or wish. He's literally saying, they're gone. That's it. They are done with. And it says in verse 3, at once some of the scribes within themselves, again, they're speaking among themselves, speaking probably with one another individually, um, all of a sudden question him because now he's taking the position that they have. But beyond that, he's actually forgiving them where their position was that we would examine the situation, we would see the man, and then we would determine whether his sins were forgiven because in the examination, they would say, if you could walk, if you had no disease, then God has forgiven you of your sins. But because you have a disease and because you can't walk and because you're crippled, God hasn't forgiven you of your sins because you're cursed. And that is not true. And so Jesus came to show that he could forgive sins while you're sick, while you're in bed, while you're a cripple, while you're dependent on someone else. God can forgive you of your sins. But he's going to go beyond that, and he literally healed a man. So they said, blasphemy. Look at the words. This man blasphemies. Notice the word man. It's in italics. It's not in the text there. So really what it says is this blasphemy. In other words, they're saying in, in a sense this nobody is blaspheming. Now, is Jesus blaspheming? In the Mishnah, it said that the blasphemer is not guilty unless he pronounces the name itself. He wasn't blaspheming against God. God wasn't involved in this. He wasn't, uh, the word blasphemy can mean like um, uh, re reproachfully speaking of someone, uh, saying evil things against them, um, desecrating their, their character, right? That's what blasphemy means. Uh, we blasphemy pe people all the time when we start talking about them and degrading them to other people. That's a, that's a form of blasphemy. Jesus wasn't doing that. He was God, and he was literally forgiving this man of his sins. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Why do you think evil in your heart? evil in your hearts now they think evil in their hearts because they are evil men because we have an evil heart and thus we think evil and they're evil for their for in verse 5 for which is easier to say your sins are forgiven you or to say arise and walk now i want to say one thing about this forgiven and i think we need to understand this and i'll, I'll go on to the define this a little more the actual greek word forgiven there means to remove the guilt resulting from wrongdoing to pardon or to forgive let me say that again to remove the guilt resulting from wrongdoing the guilt and i'll build on that in a minute here so he's saying which is easier to say to you your sins are forgiven or get up and walk many of the jews equated again healing and good health with forgiveness and divine favor If Jesus is standing here and he asked you, which is easier to do? Ask that man to stand up and walk or to say your sins are forgiven. What would you say? To make the man walk, how many would say that is easier to do? How many would say your sins are forgiven you? You guys don't want to raise your hands, do you? Either way. How many don't know? <laughs> when you read the text, you go, okay. I could say, stand up and walk. And if he doesn't stand up and walk, guess what? You know, I'm a, I look like a fool. <laughs> but I could say, your sins are forgiven you. Oh, wow, great, thank you. You know, that's easier. They can walk off and there's no evidence that you need whatsoever. You know, they might even go away a little happy and so forth. Seems to be easier. But when you really think about it at a deeper level, think about it. It's easier to say, get up and walk than it is, I forgive you your sins. Because the only one that can forgive sins is who? God. Who am I to forgive sins? Who am I to wash away the evilness of a person? Only God can do that. He was the sacrifice. He was the propitiation for our sins, as John says in 1 John. He had to appease the anger of God. And he did by the offering of his son. And so only God can forgive sin. It's hard to say, your sins are forgiven than to say, stand up and walk. But Jesus is going to demonstrate that he has the power to do both. So he proved it because the man stood up and walked. 
So he healed him, thus it means that he also forgave him of his sins. <clears throat> Let me talk about this forgiving, because I don't know where you're at, and maybe the Lord has led me to do this, because some of you are hanging on to things. In Judaism, it's clear that forgiveness demanded a certain procedure. A sacrifice you had to bring a lamb turtle dove pigeon you know so, something that you sacrificed there with the priest and then they would forgive you of your your sins after this ceremony and so forth in second samuel twelve thirteen, it said david said to nathan you remember after sinning with bathsheba i have sinned against the lord so that recognition you know that i have done wrong definitely has to be a part of our life as you're in church today, Lord, what have I done wrong? I need to confess it before you. David was confronted by Nathan. Uh, Nathan, uh, Nathan basically said, David, that man is you. Uh, you're the one that stole the man's wife. You're guilty. And David said, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to him, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. So here, David not only was forgiven, but the repercussions of that sin was also taken away, which was death, <clears throat> which is an interesting aspect here in David's life. So God can also take away the repercussion from time to time, but it doesn't always. In Psalms, it says, but he being full of compassion forgave their iniquities and did not destroy them. Yes, many times he turned his anger away and did not stir up his wrath. So here we see the Lord's having compassion on the children of Israel, that he did not destroy them because of their iniquities. And iniquities are sins that are done purposely with knowledge when you sin knowingly. In one of the Jewish writings, says a sick man does not recover from his sickness until all his sins are forgiven him. So you get the concept of what they believed. Until your sins are forgiven, then you can get up and walk. And so when Jesus did that, forgive your sins, and then walk, the Jewish mind said, wow, something about this man. And the Jewish scribes were upset where the people were amazed. In an ultimate sense, though, God was thought to have reserved this judgment, this forgiveness, ultimately at the very end for all of us. Because when we stand before him, that ultimate result of forgiveness will take place where we enter into heaven. And he says, well done, good and faithful servants. Now, it's extremely important that we note this, and this we really need to understand and get. The focus in the meaning of forgive is upon the guilt of the wrongdoer, okay? And not upon the wrongdoing itself. Let me say that again. The focus is upon the guilt of that person who has done that act and not upon the wrongdoing itself. It's not the act itself. It's the guilt resulting from the act. The event of wrongdoing is not undone. I mean, when you do something wrong, you can't undo it, right? It's done. You can't take it back. But the guilt is there. You ever do something and have a guilt complex about it? For years, I remember the, when I came to the Lord, one of the things that the Lord reminded me of was how I was stealing from my dad almost every morning while I was in high school. I would sneak into his room, get into his pants and pull out some money and put it in my pocket. And the Lord reminded me because one day I was sharing that story and my mom came up to me and said this. He blamed me for that. He was accusing me of stealing from him. And I'm like... Oh, man, the guilt just went, whoo, and I'm like, oh, my God. I didn't even know that, that she was taking the blame for me. Wow. Just like Jesus took the blame for my sins. And I asked for forgiveness from her. But the guilt Jesus can deal with, the guilt he can take away, the guilt he can remove as far as the east is from the west. To forgive, therefore, means essentially to remove the guilt 
resulting from the wrongdoing. The term for forgiveness is therefore related to guilt and not to the wrongdoing itself. It's the guilt of sin and what you have done that Jesus washes away completely. Because if you kill someone, you can't take that act back. But the guilt of killing, God can forgive. If you are guilty today, if you feel guilty because you have sinned or someone has hurt you and you feel guilty. You know, they say in molestation that a lot of times uh, people feel because God does not want us to live that way with that guilt and that molestation or abuse or sin that you may have committed when you were younger. God wants to remove that guilt. As believers, we should be walking in peace with rest and joy from all guilt because God has forgiven us of our sins. If you are hanging on it, you need to let it go. You need to let God have it because your sins are forgiven, he said. He has washed them away. So forgiveness are often literally wiped out or blot out or to do away with. It is obviously not possible to blot out or wipe out every event, but it is possible to remove and obviate the guilt. And so give the guilt to Jesus. Let him have it. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he says in verse 6 there. And the Son of Man, as the theme is, is he's the one that has the messianic power. He has the authority. He is the one that they're coming to, the Son of Man. He said to the paralytic, rise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he rose and departed to his house. Now when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God. They were blown away by this. They were blown away by this, that the fact that Jesus said, I forgive you, and the evidence that we have of your forgiveness is that now I heal you, and now stand up, take up your mat, and go home. Go home, love your family, go home, have peace, go home, serve God, walk with God, find your rest in Him, and be at ease, for I will be with you until the ends of the world. I'll never leave you or forsake you, because I love you tremendously. And they were blown away at His compassion, His love, His faithfulness to the work. They're blown away. They marveled and they glorified God. Remember the Sermon on the Mount? <clears throat> Jesus said, let your, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And these people were glorifying God in heaven by the works of Jesus Christ. We need to do our works to glorify our Father in heaven. Glorify Him in everything that you do, everything that you say. There was a story of a man in China who was in love with a young lady. He wrote her over 500 love letters just to get her to marry him. It worked. She married the postman. <laughs> she created a relationship with the postman rather than the writer. <laughs> Be careful not to lift up the delivery man. <laughs> you know, lift up the name of Jesus. Glorify him. They were amazed who's given this man such power, such power. This man, Jesus, the son of man, not son of woman, not talking about his humanity, but talking about being the son of man above all things. You know, as Colossians says, the firstborn of all things, the first created. Some application in closing. Bring your cares to Jesus because he cares for you, Peter says. And so we can bring those cares and, and literally bring them, guys. Don't be ashamed or shy and saying, God, I, I'm bringing you this care. I, I'm really concerned. I'm really upset. You know, I just want to lay it before you, God. Would you take this from me? I know I shouldn't have it. Uh, I'm bringing you this guilt. I'm bringing you this idea. I'm bringing you this anger. Lord, I, I, you need to take it. Bring it to him. It's amazing how I talk to people. And I said, have you prayed, prayed to the Lord and given that? No. Why not? You need to give it to him. You need to talk to him. You need to lay that care before him. And then trust Jesus. Then just say, here it is, Lord. I trust that you'll heal me. You'll forgive me. You'll hand her, handle the situation, Lord. And then don't feel guilty. 
Let God wipe away the guilt. Get rid of that guilt. Stop feeling that guilt. Let Jesus have it and be free. Be free. And do not accuse Jesus of wrongdoing like the scribes. No, he, he's there for you. He's there to help you because he loves you.